All right, we're going to get started with our last lecture for today. My favorite subject, telling stories through drawing. Um, I'm Rita Sabler. I'm the education director for uh, the Urban Sketchers. I serve on the board. I'm a visual journalist. Uh, I am an urban sketcher. I teach workshops on urban sketching, on visual journalism, on storytelling. Um, I teach at different art schools, universities in my hometown, which is Portland, Oregon, West Coast, United States. And I travel all over the world. I get to uh, do some cool projects. So I am kind of very, very fortunate to, to, do, uh, to do this for a living. And my big passion is storytelling. So using urban sketching, using drawing as a tool to tell stories. And what I would like you to do uh, before we get started is turn to your neighbor. Uh, if you're sitting by yourself, find someone and just tell them, um, tell them about what happened. Um, I know you've been in this room for a while, some of you, but what happened on the way over here? What happened this morning? So just about a minute. Hi, my name is. So as I was walking to AUT this morning, here's what happened to me. So as I'm watching you talking to each other right now, I see all of your faces are lighting up. You're, you're smiling, you're nodding, you're sharing stories, right? Simple stories, maybe mundane stories, but they're stories. And that is something that appeals to all of us, to all of our human nature, uh, because stories is our main communication tool. That's how we, that's how we greet each other a lot of times. That's how we, when we call our mom or our family, we say, hey, guess what happened? And you tell a story, right? So it's something that is, um, it's in our collective human memory. It is a clue to our emotions. And it's sort of our shared human experience. But the question is, a million dollar question, how do you create a story? So in my talk today, I will give you a formula, it's, it's just one formula for, for telling a story that, that narrative writers or screenwriters use. Um, but we will go actually, of course, into the realm of visual storytelling because we're sketchers, we're artists, we are using visual tools to tell stories. So what are some tips on creating a good visual story? That would be the main subject of my talk. I will give you a checklist to kind of keep in mind to follow in order to tell a good story. And I will give you some examples. A lot of work that I've done is in the realm of reportage, which is visual storytelling. And I will show you some um, other artists. If How many of you have been to, um, attended the lecture by Mario Benares yesterday on the history of reportage? Okay, so this gave you a good base, gave you some fantastic examples. Um, I kind of changed my lecture a little bit this morning so that I don't go over some of the same examples. So you have some different examples, um, but also kind of more practical tools. But keep in mind, if you, haven't, if you haven't heard his lecture, all of these lectures will be recorded. So it was a fantastic primer, fantastic um, retrospective on, on how visual storytelling and reportage is done. And then I will tell you how to, after I share some tips and tools, how you can get involved, maybe get a little bit of money from Urban Sketchers to start working on your own projects. 
and show you some of the examples by um, uh, reportage grant winners um, from 2021. So um, how do you create a story? Uh, one formula um, is called the ABT method. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. <laughs> it's, um, it's sort of the simplest, and I, I, love, I love the simplicity of it, the simplest storytelling structure. Um, and it was developed by uh, a guy called Randy Olson, and it stands for A, but, therefore. So each one of these words corresponds to an act of a story. The first act is set, it sets you in the present with two pieces of information. The end connects two pieces of information that describes the situation so that you have a common foundation, common knowledge on which to stand. The second word is very important. It's the word but. <laughs> And it's, what does but mean here? What is it? An exception. An exception, yes. Or you, if you want to be even more dramatic. Problem, conflict, right? Because if you just have a series of ends, it's, it's sort of too benign. So you need to introduce an element of conflict. And that's what but does. And therefore is the third act of a story. And it is essentially a resolution. Ah. <laughs> so if we apply this formula to our current situation, our topic today, here's what we can say. Stories are an incredibly powerful way for us to understand our world. And we already use stories to communicate in our daily life. But, uh -huh. <laughs> the theme from Shark, <laughs> we already, uh, but we also need to learn how to tell stories in drawing. Therefore, we came to this lecture to learn some tips and create stories. So visual storytelling is already built into urban sketching movement. We've talked, my previous two colleagues have talked to you extensively about the manifesto. And one of the manifestos, um, one of the points in the manifesto says, our drawings tell the story of our surroundings, the places we live and where we travel. So that is why urban sketching and storytelling are linked at a hip, always. <laughs> We can't forget that. It's not just about technique, tools, composition, values. All those things are important. But it is, in essence, is storytelling. And why is that? Why, what sets urban sketching apart from other art movements? We always say you have to be drawing on location, right, from direct observation. Can you tell stories of what is happening when you're sitting at a studio drawing from a Google Street view or from, from your references? <laughs> it's really, it's, 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 I feel it's, it's almost impossible. So when we preach, oh, you have to be sitting on location. Yes, uncomfortable. Yes, sometimes it rains. Yes, people can bother you. Yes, there's all this nuances, there's all these obstacles, but when you are actually there witnessing what is happening, you are becoming a storyteller. Because as you're drawing this beautiful building, learning how to use charcoal powder yesterday, for me, my personal experience yesterday in a workshop, a woman comes out from the restaurant and says, oh, you know, my parents started this place and they're immigrants and they brought their, their recipes and they did this. And, and so you are absorbing that story. You're becoming the recipient of that. That's a very privileged position to be in. When people see you draw on location, they get really moved by, by that act, by, that, by the fact that you give your attention, your time, your skill to that place and they want to come and share their stories with you. You're also sitting there, and it's not just your eyes that are taking in the information, 
It is also your ears. You're hearing the construction noises. You're hearing birds chirping, and ideally, more ideally, <laughs> you're sensing the temperature, um, wind, rain, the uncomfortable seat under your butt. All those things are informing the style of your drawing and they're, they're becoming part of your story. So that's why we draw on location. That's, that's the reason, not because there is an urban sketching police that will come and, and arrest you if you're sitting and, and, and drawing in a studio, which is a fantastic way to practice, but it's not an experience, it's an exercise. So that's the difference. Um, so you have to put on a journalist hat, an artist as a reporter. Before there was video cameras and cameras and phones and all of our technology, artists were the only people who would tell a visual account of whatever was happening. They were sent into war fields, they were sent into uh, executions, coronations, whatever important events were happening at the time. The story was told by an artist with their pen, with their um, whatever tools they had to use. And we've heard a fantastic account from, from Mario yesterday. Once again, look it up if you, if you missed it. Um, of course, with the invention of the photography, it's, it's become a little different. So how do we tell a story um, visually? A lot of times it's our intention. What separates the, a, a drawing, a pretty postcard view from an account of a place, from a document, documentation of a place or a reportage. If you're going there with an intention of documenting something, it will be different than the intention of, I just wanna create a very pretty landscape. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. I love to do landscapes myself. <laughs> I give myself the permission to sometimes just draw, just draw a pretty view, a pretty building. Uh, but if I'm going there with an intention of finding out what happened, I have a different mindset, right? I maybe do a little bit of research beforehand. I think about where am I going, what's happening, who are the key players, and what is my goal, what is my purpose to be there? And as a journalist, as an artist reporter, as a correspondent, you're establishing a sense of place and time. And that is once again, reminiscent of what? <laughs> of manifesto, somebody said, yeah. That is one of the points once again, is because a visual story needs to establish a sense of place, of place in time. Um, how do you do that in a drawing? Give me some examples. Context, Context? yes, for example. Uh, backdrop. Backdrop. backdrop, yes. If you're trying to say, for example, fall, um, as, as we are here in Southern Hemisphere experiencing early fall, what are some things that you can draw that give you that feeling of what would, things you include trees. trees yeah trees a, a lot of times in a place kind of signal the change of seasons right people's attire what people are wearing are they carrying umbrellas are they wearing coats um what can give you a sense of like maybe a larger time scale of events you know we just experienced this kind of massive human large-scale event that, you know, if you look at drawings or photographs before and after, it's not quite the same or during. <laughs> Any ideas? Yeah, so like in, for example, the COVID pandemic, you can clearly see, and, and we're kind of tuned into it, right? When we see people wearing masks, we know uh, that, we're probably post 2019. <laughs> you see a lot of masks, probably 2020, <laughs> you see less masks. <laughs> so those are some clues that give us a sense of when, right? What about a place, where? 
Yes, absolutely. Yeah, those are the things that we like to sketch as urban sketchers anyways. So <laughs> certain um, elements of uh, what we call urban furniture in the business. So things like lampposts, uh, benches, um, sometimes they're very specific, garbage cans. They're very specific to a place, to a country, to a city. So don't overlook those. What you see is not going to make it into your drawing. Not all of it is just impossible to draw everything. So what you include becomes an important element in your storytelling. So you're the director who chooses elements um, that you include. And likewise, what you, do, what you choose to exclude also becomes part of that story because it's, it's less important. Every element has to contribute to the narrative you're cre creating. So, you know, we have limited time, we have limited skills, but this, the elements that you choose, once again, gain importance. So they become part of that um, important storytelling. Here's a little checklist to kind of help you situate yourself into, into this reportage journalistic set of mind. So first of all, everything starts with your interest. Once you choose the subject, something that interests you, something that has been a subject of fascination for you. For me, it's very kind of intuitive because I get really into something. I get so obsessed with it. I keep thinking about it all the time. Right now it's my master's thesis. I'm doing a master's in journalism and it's the subject of, of burials in different cultures. And so that's all kind of what I want to think about and talk about. And I'm very sorry for my friends and family who have to listen to, <laughs> to this subject endlessly, but I'm obsessed and it helps me to kind of ask the right questions because I want to know more, I want to understand. So that's where it starts, is that curiosity, that interest in the subject. So what it is, once you found your perfect reportage subject, what it is that interests you about it, um, it's, it's that personal curiosity and you want to convey that about the situation. So this is one of the projects that I did a uh, number of years ago now, but that was something that I heard as a, as a little kid from my mom. She said, you know, on the island of Molokai, there is a leprosy colony um, and there are people still living there. And I was like, leprosy colony, people, <laughs> people are living on an island and they're isolated. And um, so I was, I became obsessed. I, I, eventually got uh, permission to go there. It's very, very closed. Um, and I, I learned there were still, at the time, uh, eight people who, who were living there. Um, of course, there's a state hospital, there's the whole, the national park and, and all the facilities to take care of them, but there were eight patients who were still living there. And I wanted to tell the story of these people, of the place in drawing. So what do you know about your subject and how can you find out more? One of the things they told me in Kalaupapa in the leprosy colony is that, okay, you cannot interview the patients. We want to protect their privacy. We don't want any prying eyes coming here and bothering them. So I was like, how am I, how am I gonna tell the story of these people um, if I can't talk to them? I went to the, um, they had like a little, uh, sort of an archive place where they kept the shoes of all the patients that have passed away. And the shoes sort of told the story because the disease is, uh, distort, uh, deforms your, your feet and your hands. And so these people had no access to um, like a professional orthopedic um, shoemaker. So they had to kind of modify their shoe wear to make sure that they could still walk and, and wear them. So I learned and documented, drew their, drew their um, shoes and um, as, as I had access to, uh, to a historian, the historian there who told me their stories. Um, there was this one woman who loved cats. She had like hundreds of cats. So her shoe still had cat fur, a cat fur stuck to it. And she passed away many, many years ago. 
So, you know, look for places where you can find those things. Uh, they're not always obvious. Next is to pay attention and look for things that um, can kind of tell that story. Once again, um, it's a place where about 8,000 people have passed away. And so, and only eight were living at the time. So the whole island, a part of the island is just one big grave graveyard. So you have tons of um, tombstones. You have sometimes a, a, a tree growing out of a tombstone, which I thought was kind of a very powerful metaphor for the place, right? Capturing the key moment. If you happen to be there at the right time, it's, it's tricky, might not always happen, but if you are there at the right time and you can capture that moment when something happens in front of you, even if your tools are very simple and, and you have to draw fast and the proportions are wrong, but if you can draw and capture that moment that somebody cuts the eucalyptus, a lot of times text captions, a little bit of writing kind of can help fill in the lack of, of, um, of drawing skills or um, in this case, um, you know, it's a simple act of, of cutting off a tree, but if you are there to kind of witness it and draw it as much as you can, as fast as you can. So a lot of times I tell my students that when you're putting a visual story together, sometimes it helps to think about it in terms of a simple sentence structure. So when we build our sentences, we think about where. So that's where you draw your background context, as Alvin was saying. Are you at a market? Are you in a um, busy urban center? Are you in a forest? How do you establish that sense of place, right? Where, then who? The main characters, who are the people involved? In this case, uh, it's a little a story about this marina where fishermen bring their catch and they clean it right there. <clears throat> what is happening? That's the hardest part to draw, of course, because you have to draw things quickly. Their activity action is happening. And then finally, what? Uh, the objects, visual lists, things that, you know, if there's no action happening, that's where you can go and document things and take your time. Usually things, objects do not move. <laughs> so you can put in more detail, take more time with that. So that's just one way, one simple formula. We talked about the and, but, and therefore, as, a, as kind of a general um, formula of storytelling in narrative writing. And this is a simple formula of, of building your visual story. So something you can try. Once again, where you are, who are the main characters, what's happening, and what. So your objects and your visual lists. Um, how you present your story is also important because think about if we're drawing in a sketchbook and we're telling a story that takes up several drawings and you have things kind of interrupted because you also decided to draw your friends or your lunch in the middle, then you kind of broke up that feeling that you're in that space, right? So if you're planning to do a reportage project, maybe either set aside a separate sketchbook for that. Um, I like to use this accordion concertina, laparello, there are many terms for it, because it kind of gives you that uh, feeling of a continuous thing unfolding. So yesterday in my skit sketch, I talked about the, the concertina that I did. It was almost five meters long about the Camino de Santiago. Um, in, in the reportage work, this is a story about the the project in my hometown where they take out the unnecessary pavement to create more green spaces in the city. <clears throat> so it, it was a good, a, kind of a good format to tell that story because you're following people, volunteers in the course of the day, 
you know, they come in, they assess the, the scope of project, they line up, they do their exercises, you know, there, I did some interviews. Um, there's also um, something called a one page reportage where you kind of create a large scale drawing with details, you know, you break the rules of perspective to kind of include different information. Um, and Oliver Kugler is, uh, I'm sorry, Olivia Kugler is one of the uh, artists who uses uh, one page, rep page reportage um, format a lot. Another one is our own Simo Kapeki, who is here as a correspondent. Um, she does a one page reportage for a travel magazine in Italy, which is always stunning and fantastic. So check that out. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the projects that I did in my reportage work. So one of the things that interested me was the this idea of border towns. So border towns are communities that are living on two sides of a of a border. In my case, uh, we have a border with uh, with Mexico, and there are some towns that sometimes have the same name. They're separated by a wall, but you have a community living on kind of two sides of the wall. And sometimes there are families that are broken down by a wall. You have a lot of uh, very strong connections. So I went to the town called Nogales, and this is how the wall looks like. It goes straight through a town, straight through a community. A lot of times you have people crossing the border back and forth in order to do their shopping. So they would go from Mexico into the United States to buy some milk and go back. Um, and visually, it's, it's really, um, I mean, it's ugly, it's horrible. Um, and spending a lot of time drawing ugly things is, is also good exercise. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's obviously, um, there's a, a big political societal context to the story that I'm not gonna go into. If you wanna read uh, about this project, I have all of this projects on my website. Um, I talked to uh, some of the families that live on two uh, sides of the um, border. This is a pedestrian cross point. So every time you go from Mexico to United States and back and forth, you have to go through, uh, there's I think seven crossings in this particular town. So one is pedestrian, one is for cattle, one is for freight trains, one is, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's all kind of very elaborate. And as I was, as I was drawing um, the wall and I was drawing on the border, I noticed there was this really fancy bridal shop right adjacent to the wall. <laughs> I was thinking, what, a, what an interesting choice for a bridal shop location to put it right on the border. And as luck would have it, um, as I was drawing, the owner of the shop came out and started talking to me. I'm lucky because I'm an introvert. It's hard for me to start conversations, but drawing um, something kind of gives me that platform gives me the clue because people approach and I put in my, <laughs> my journalistic claws into them. And, um, and so what I learned is that the choice was intentional. They put the bridal shop on the border because most of their customers are in Mexico and they're buying fancy dresses for the weddings or the quinceanera, which is the celebration uh, when a girl turns 15, there's a huge elaborate celebration. So he said that a lot of times the customers would look at a dress through the opening in the wall and then send somebody over who had the right papers to go pick up the, the, the dress. So <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so it was a very commercially driven decision. And sometimes the, the border between the United States and Mexico looks like this. It's um, so sometimes you have this reinforced wall with the with concertina wire and spikes and, and dogs and lights. And sometimes you just have this 
kind of very porous uh, opening, usually long stretches of farmland and um, documented that as well. Okay. Um, another kind of long-term project of mine was the social justice protests in my, in my city, which is very active politically, very involved in the um, protest movement. So I started in 2016, and I think by the end of 2020, I had at least 10 concertinas <laughs> documenting all the different protests that happened in the course of the four years. Um, I need to jump out of my PowerPoint, but here's, here's the dilemma. I might, so I wanted to show you some examples. Um, hey, of how storytelling could be done, combining drawing and sound. Um, something I'm experimenting with a lot, but Here's a project um, by Franklin McMahon, and yesterday Mario talked about him, and here's a little example of, of a project of less kind of dramatic and, and um, let's put it this way, uh, complicated nature <laughs> as the ones I showed you, because you don't always have to pick very serious, difficult subjects for your reportage. Um, I, in fact, I have... Um, a book um, here that Gabi has published that's about New York. And it's kind of a very happy project because it was done in the wake of the um, awakening of New York after the pandemic. Um, and this is kind of a similar thing, uh, an American city at Christmas time. I like it because it's, it's something that we can all think about, you know, how to, where to start with reportage, how to tell a story. Well, a celebration is a great way to start. So something that is, um, you know, how does your town, how does your city celebrate something, your community celebrate something? Um, so here you have the artist, uh, Franklin McMahon, in this case, narrating over his drawings. And it's, this was done, um, I think, in the 60s or 70s. 70s. So before Cans Burns effect, before all the um, fancy animation tools that we have now at our disposal, basically just panning the camera over your drawing, zooming in and out. <laughs> and he's telling the story. And there's the natural sound. So the sound is something that's very important also for the story. I kind of became, become accustomed to always have um, a recorder with me so that I record the sound bed of what's happening. And it, together with drawing, it kind of creates this almost a movie effect. So we're just going to play a little bit of it to give you a sense. And I don't think it's connected to the sound, right? So it's Franklin just Franklin from... is an artist reporter whose work has taken him all over the world. Now he turns toward the city of his birth to tell this story in drawings and paintings, his tribute to an American city at Christmas time. We have to have all the trees done before Thanksgiving. We got four weeks to do them all. 120, 150. Well, it has to be done by Thanksgiving, because that's when lights go on. Traditionally wise, I would say that as far as Christmas in Chicago, there's nothing like Christmas at Marshall Field and Company. Okay, okay, now down by your, by your right foot. Down further, a little bit more to the right. We start in June. Yeah, we have to make the same ornaments in three, four sizes and graduate. And there's a different theme every year, and we never use the same one in twice. It's a total new look each year. And all the snowflakes that you see are all hand cut individually, one at a time. And there are thousands of snowflakes on there. Oh, yeah. Jet. Well, we have people who call from all over who ask us when our tree is going up because they want to come in from out of town. I like that monkey. From all over the United States and all over the world. And the biggest thrill for most kids, like I remember when I was a, a youngster, was to see Santa Claus on the eighth floor at Cozy Cloud Cottage and to have breakfast and make it. It's become a tradition to have breakfast with the family under the tree. And you know, when so many things have changed, it's nice to know it's still a tradition. <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> okay, you get the idea of what um, what this kind of com combination of, of natural sound and panning over drawings, what effect it creates. Um, so on my website, ritasalber.com, you can see some of my other projects uh, that involve reportage. Um, another kind of difficult subject is the wildfires that we've had in my state that have devastated some communities. So that was a more involved project of, of going there and interviewing the survivors, telling their stories, showing kind of the aftermath of the... Um, some projects are pretty simple. Um, for example, this one is a story of this um, <clears throat> restaurant owner and his, um, his little restaurant, which was very sweet. And I wanted to document his, um, his business because he's such a proud um, business owner in the little town of Loreto, Baja California. Yeah, the LGBTQ pioneers in my town. Um, that was also a really great project to kind of tell stories of older folks who are um, living and, and, you know, have forgotten. Um, we had recently lost sort of the, um, the star of, of, of the city, uh, Darcel 15th passed away just a couple of weeks ago. And she was uh, the oldest working drag queen in, in the world. Um, she was still at the age of 90 giving shows almost every night. And I was lucky enough to go into her home and interview her. And it was, it was just a fantastic, um, fantastic experience. Um, and then I wanted to conclude with kind of um, a urban sketching initiative a project that we are a grant that we've done in 2020, 2021. Uh, what we asked um, sketchers to do is send us an idea for a reportage project. And if, um, if it kind of checks some, some of the requirements that we've, um, we had the, um, a little committee selecting, selecting the great projects. And in 2021, uh, we received, uh, I think over 60 proposals. Uh, five of them went on to, to become full on projects. So they've submitted their stories. There was a, um, a story about the, um, Kind of a drug rehabilitation social services uh, room in Paris. There was a story about a market in uh, Pune that you've, if, once again, if you heard Paris uh, presentation yesterday, I think she's publishing a book and she was one of our reportage grant winners. Um, and you can check out on the urbansketchers.org um, some of the other projects that we were, we selected for this program. So I really encourage you to start thinking about a story that moves you, a project that moves you that will be, could be told in, in this format. So the deadline for a 2023 reportage grant is May 15th. There's not a lot of time, but if you promise me that you have something interesting in mind, we might extend the deadline. Um, because I feel like um, this way of, of looking at the world and sharing stories is, is incredibly powerful. Um, and it's, I think all of, the, um, all of the people that I know who are urban sketchers who tell stories are very happy doing that. And there are a lot more who want to learn how <laughs> who want to do it. So hopefully I gave you some tips and some ideas on how to get started. Um, so by May 15th, if you are thinking, um, all you have to do is send us a few examples of, of drawings that you're, you're thinking is not a complete project that needs to be presented. Then once, if your project, once and if your project is selected, you'll have um, until the end of the year to work on the actual project and 
will publish it on our channels and help you with a little bit of money to maybe turn it into a book or present it or offset some of the costs associated with this. What's your range of uh, costs of um, so we ask you to kind of give us an approximate idea of what costs you might have. Um, it's not a huge amount of money that we give out, unfortunately. Um, I th think, Janine, I think it was set at 500, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and we'll and we also encourage partnerships, so collaborations. If you have, if you want to submit like a, a chapter project, that's uh, completely acceptable. In fact, we had one of the projects that received a, a grant was was a chapter project last couple of years ago. Uh, so we will publish um, on in drawing attention, which is our uh, quarterly magazine. We'll publish on our website, on social media uh, for Urban Sketchers. Um, as far as publishing beyond that, um, we're kind of looking into some other ways that we can um, help, um, or at least give you some ideas of where to go. Um, I think that's pretty much all I wanted to cover. So I would be happy to answer any questions about anything in this realm of visual storytelling. Apart from the grant, the saving you need to work. Yeah, so the mentoring for the projects that we've selected, so the five, um, we usually give some feedback on the proposal um, as far as what, what what could be done, what could be improved, what things to look into. Yes. Um, it's a digital one, right? One can see it online. One can see it online. It's usually linked. Um, if you subscribe, um, you get an email notification every time it's published. And you can find all of the back issues um, on our website. How much is it? It's free. Okay. Yeah. It's called, it's called drawing attention. And it's posted to the main the main page of the website. Right now, right now, our um, we're obviously focusing heavily our home page on, on the symposium because that's where the most of the information comes out. So it will be on the main website. So it's free to go down on the left hand side. And there's uh one down on the left, right? I'm kind of in the doing it in the blind. Yeah, so. Sorry. yeah so here on this page you can subscribe um, to be notified, and here are all the back issues. Yeah. And it's a fantastic source of inspiration. There are tips, there are tutorials, there are um, projects, there are stories about chapters. The, the team that puts it together does a fantastic job and they, and they try to focus heavily on storytelling as well. Any other questions? Uh -huh. um, no, it's, it's a handout for a workshop that I teach. So I just kind of threw it on there. <laughs> Let me see. <clears throat> yeah. 
Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Yeah. See some good stories. Also, I mean, Rita is one of the most incredible repertoire artists and storytellers with words and pictures. I don't know if everybody here knows she's not talking about it, but she uh, has just published an amazing book. Um, and you can find them upstairs. It's about the reawakening of New York. Um, it is incredible. It is gorgeous. <laughs> I don't know how many copies are, but I will promote them for her. So if you go up to the art market, um, there's still maybe some left that you could get if you're hands on in person. Um, and it's published by Gabi. So you're also supporting, you're mostly supporting him. <laughs> and then maybe if you like show <laughs> I'll be very happy to sign it. All right. Thank you all again. Um, I hope to see some good stories from you. Thank you.